afternoon. Happy Friday. This is Kaui Lucas with Hawaii is my mainland. And today we're focusing on a different part of the world that is having ever more increasing impact on Hawaii. I mean, certainly China and Hawaii have a, a more than century old relationship. I'm not sure how, but we're coming close to two. More than two, two. centuries. More it's than gotta two. be close, yeah. yeah. Um, actually, one of my ancestors took the first boat from the Hawaiian kingdom to uh, China, oh. Ca Captain Alexander Adams, yeah. So, um, but now, Things are, it's a very different world, and um, even more sort of prescient in this um, uh, political climate, the discussion of ethics. And usually, the idea of business ethics, one doesn't normally jump immediately to China as a, a paragon of, of business ethics. We, it, they get a bad rap. But um, soon enough, in Honolulu, we are going to have a, um, a series of events here, exploring and dialogues and talking about the importance of ethics um, in, in the quest for peace. Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited to hear about this and um, running into you at, uh, at the Capitol the other day. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot going on. T tell us what's, what's the series of events that are, that are happening. Okay. There's a series of events starting on December the 12th that involve Zhou Enlai and his wife, Deng Ying Chao. He was the first premier of modern China, and she was his wife. And it's called Deep Love. It's an exhibition, and then there's a seminar that comes out of it, the Business Ethics Seminar. And Deep Love is based on the idea that two people meet at the beginning of a revolution when they're 18. And they decide they're going to devote their lives to that revolution and to transforming the world. They spend the next 60 years doing that together. And it ain't easy, because it's the 20th century and it's China. You've got revolution, you've got civil war, you've got war with Japan, you've got the cultural revolution, famine, disease, disaster, assassination, and also great triumph, great vision. And the establishment from the ruins of the Chinese dynasties of emperors of 6,000 years. The establishment of a new modern oriented China, which has let go of all of the vestiges of feudal uh, culture and is trying to face forward, trying to become part of the world, but in a very Chinese way, right? <laughs> China is right. not, they will, they do not want to copper, copy America. They do not want to copy Europe. They know and respect America, Europe, and all the countries of Asia, but China, you know, the word China, Zhongguo, in their own language means the center. You draw a circle and a line through the middle, that's China. Okay, so from their point of view, they are the oldest continuous civilization on the planet. They have a longer history, longer set of culture and religion and uh, literature and so on that, than anybody else, than practically everybody else put together, right? Okay. So um, they are now reestablishing themselves at the head of the table of nations along with all the other leaders. So when you grasp that, you understand what Zhou Enlai and Deng Ying Chao accomplished, with, of course, many, many thousands of others. But Zhou Enlai was the first premier and foreign minister, and Deng Ying Chao was the leader of the women's movement. She transformed life for women in China. So the event here in Hawaii is going to be, there'll be, um, talk about the exhibit at um, the Capitol, the Rotunda. Yeah, the, the exhibit or was developed by the people at the Zhou Enlai National Memorial in Huayan, which is where he was born, in central China. And some of the leading scholars from Huayan and from the Central Committee in Beijing will be here to talk about how their relationship endured. You know, they didn't have the usual stresses that you and I have with our relationships, right? <laughs> you know, sustaining a, a marriage over 60 years you get a gold star anyways, right? anyways. regardless, <laughs> right? But 
they, you know, they almost died many times in each other's arms. They lost children, they saw massacres, they were pursued in the middle of the night. They had their friends and neighbors executed because they were their friends and neighbors. There were many times there were people who deliberately tried to break their hearts, to break their resolve, and yet they continued. And at the very end of life, um, Zhou Enlai wrote a poem, as he did throughout their 60 years together. He wrote a poem to her and said, now my old red heart will cease to beat, but our love has never decreased. So Michael North, you I, are the um, co-founder of the Zhou Enlai uh, Peace Institute here in Hawaii. Yeah. Um, does it have a corollary in China? Is there? Yes. Yes, okay. We have a Beijing office as well. Okay. So that you're, you're working to bring this, this powerful love story mm. to our, our, our capital. That's, I mean, kudos for just having, having the thought of that, <laughs> much less making it happen. Yeah. It's um, this a beautiful integration, really a beautiful integration. So, and then that is also that same idea, the integrating ethics and business. So yeah. there on, uh, on Tuesday will be the um, ethics in business? Yes, on the morning of Tuesday, December the 13th at Chaminade University, they have a nice conference center called, called the Qing Conference Center. Appropriately it's, Chinese. It's, yes, by <laughs> one of our leading local uh, Chinese entrepreneurs who and built it. And philanthropists. Yes, and uh, purely by chance, <laughs> it's being held there. Um, and. Both, uh, both of these events are free, open to the public, and just free you know, reservations online to get your confirmed tickets. But the idea of, of ethics goes deep into the heart of who Zhou Enlai was. Zhou Enlai was born before the emperors were gone, he, so he was born in the imperial time. His family were advisors to emperors going back hundreds of years right at the very center of the imperial court in Beijing. And yet he grew up saying, we're gonna throw off all of that, all of that primitive feudal structure in which there's a very few people at the center of the society in Beijing who literally never see anybody else. That's why they call it the forbidden city because it's forbidden for anyone to go in. They only see foreign diplomats. Ordinary Chinese people never even see the emperor. Well, that's really and, a good way to keep control on things. Yeah, and they, Zhou Enlai took the United States as one of his models for creating a, uh, for creating a new tradition of freedom and openness for China. Uh, he studied the, uh, the League of Nations and the United Nations Charter, and he brought a lot of those things into it, and he and others wrote the Constitution of modern China. Now, have they been perfect in executing the high vision and principles of the Constitution of China? No, they would admit that. Has the United States been perfect in executing the high principles of our Constitution, which is 250 years old? No, I think most <laughs> Americans would concede that. Yes. Is it a worthwhile effort and a vision to continue to try to reinvent ourselves and come closer and closer to those high standards? Yes, on both sides of the Pacific, here and in China. And having spent a lot of time there over the past number of years, and through the Zhou Enlai Peace Institute being able to meet with a number of, of very prominent people in Chinese society business, and government and legal and academic and so on, as well as many, many just ordinary people. Um, I know in my heart, I'm convinced that the Chinese people are as sincere in their will to peace as the American people fundamentally are. Are there strands? Are there times? Are there places and people that seem to pull in another direction? Yes. Are there such here in America? Yes. So seeing that, what is our responsibility, you and I? Seeing that, seeing those contradictions, but also the high standard and vision. 
our duty is to do what we can to build a people's diplomacy. That, pe that people's, I, I, I read that in the literature, the, the, the pe person to person diplomacy. Yeah. But the, the sort of the, the fundamental, I mean, underpinnings of, of peace sort of, there's a, there's a presumption that there's some sort of justice there. And um, I mean, at least that's the way we see it. I, I don't pretend to know anything about the Chinese mindset. Um, uh, just that, uh, at least here, we um, have that assumption that without without justice, there there yes. really isn't peace. Right. And um, is that would that be accurate to say? That's very consonant with both traditional Chinese philosophy going back to Confucius and coming forward to today. Uh, the, the word justice may be translated in different ways, may be represented in different ways. Let, let me give you an example. Zhou Enlai wrote Five Principles of Peace. He was at a moment of despair in 1954 because it looked like everything that they had tried was going to be go away in ashes. They were just a few years away from the Second World War, right? Europe was still in ruins. Asia was still crippled. Japan was still on its back. All the colonial empires were all falling apart, and the Korean War was going on. The, Viet the Indo Chinese War, right, in, in Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia was raging. The colonial empires were trying to hold on to what they could, and what did we have? We had thermonuclear weapons on both sides of the Soviet Union and the United States facing each other. It was a time, probably one of the most hopeless times in history. And he asked himself the question, is there anything that we could all agree on? Is there anything that's so fundamental that nobody would argue with it? And he proposed, as the first of the five principles, he proposed that people have the fundamental right to live and work and walk on the land in which they were born. Wow. Love it. Which is let straight us take, into let's, Hawaiian let us, culture. Yes, straight into Hawaiian. Would you yeah. repeat that? And then we're going to go to a break. People have the fundamental right to live and work and walk on the land in which they were born. I love that. We'll be right back. Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you excited about my new show, which is called Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. And it's going to be on Think Tech Hawaii from downtown Honolulu on Tuesday afternoons, 5 p.m. And we're going to talk about uh, to make architecture more inclusive on the islands, which is, what hu which is one of the definitions of humane, which is being tolerant of, uh, you know, many people of nature, of many other influences. So we're going to have some great guests, like today's guest, for example, uh, my collaborator, David Rockwood, who is the author of the awesome um, manifestation of uh, humane architecture in the background. So see you on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. I look forward to. Welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kawi Lucas, and with me today is Michael North, who is the co-founder of the Zhou Enlai Peace Institute here in Hawaii, mm. along with his gorgeous wife, Xiao Fang. I'm sorry she isn't here yeah. to join us, but um, she'll probably be here for the festivities. She I will. Imagine. She's coming back next Tuesday. And she knows a lot about this, right? It's, it's in her blood. It's literally. in her blood. It's, uh, he was her great... Zhou Enlai uncle. was her great uncle. There we go. There we go. So, so. she grew up in the center of Beijing and grew up at a time when it was not a good thing to be a person of power in China. People were always being torn down, you know. There was, there was an ethic that was created that all old things are evil, that everything has to be destroyed. Before we can create anything new, we have to destroy everything of the old. And it was a very challenging time. And Zhou Enlai stood for a different approach. A different approach that in integrated some of the old. That integrated the heart, the essence, the purity, the greatness of the old, and yet eliminated all of the inequities and injustices. So when at the IUCN, I was in one of the um, breakout sessions, and there was a, a German professor who was talking um, 
Um, it, it was about <laughs> it was about ethics in the environment and business, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, he's been a professor in at a uh, I'm not sure it's the University of Tokyo, but a Japanese university for many years. And he said that um, it was a Confucian principle, which I claim to know nothing of. Um, that um, that there has to be a you know, for, for it to really matter, that there has to be a financial component. In other words, if, if there's a lawsuit, you can't claim damages for emotional or, or something else. It, you have to have a, a, some kind of financial harm, that you're not really doing something bad to somebody else unless there's a financial component to that. And I thought, wow, is that really true? Mm -hmm. is, there, is there some sort of Confucian thing that that, does that make sense? Or maybe I'm not asking the right person. I don't know. <laughs> yes and no. You know, there are layers of Confucian philosophy. There, are, It's thousands of years deep, many interpretations. If you go back to the source, same way as in Christianity, let's say, if you go back to the source in the original Gospels and you say, I, I'm, I'm a fanatic Christian when it comes to that kind of interpretation. I'm a real fundamentalist, right? But not in the churchified way necessarily. I respect all churches and religions and so on. But in that way, Zhou Enlai was a fundamentalist Confucian. And he would say that equity and mutual respect are the fundamentals of justice. Right? So another one of his five principles was just because you may be bigger or richer than me, we are still equal. So even well, the largest countries are equal to the smallest countries. Even the most powerful and the wealthiest are equal to the most marginalized and the poorest. Even the healthiest are equal to the sickest. This was a principle of equity. And mutual respect is the other one. You know? Well, mutual respect, I guess, I mean, if you don't have that, why, why sit down together? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, speaking of sitting down together, so next week at Chaminade in the Qing Conference Center, mm. there will be a morning of discussions around business and ethics. Can you, can you kind of give the, the framework yeah. for that? Yeah. So, there will be both Chinese and American speakers. One of the speakers from China is Li Jinping, who's coming from Beijing, and he represents the Central Committee, and he will be talking about uh, the principles that I'm talking, that I'm referring to, that are fundamental to Zhou Enlai, that everybody in China is taught, and especially if you're going to go into being in the dip diplomatic corps in China, you have to learn these principles first and foremost. And he'll be talking about the fact that, in order for us to sustain peace between us, it's not enough for us to have treaties. It's not enough for us to to hold each other at bay militarily. It's not enough for presidents and prime ministers to meet. It has to be fundamental in the hearts of the people because in the end, governments can only do what the people support them to do. And so he'll be talking about if we have business respect and mutual trade and so on, from which everyone gains, that will create not only the mechanics of mutual self-interest, you know, like you're my customer, I'm your client, I pay you, you pay me, we make money. That's just the mechanical part of it. It will create the fact that these folks come to Honolulu from Beijing and Shanghai and Suzhou and Shenzhen and Xi'an and other places. And we're going to sit with them and talk to them face to face. We're going to share a meal. We're going to share tea. We're going to talk about our families. We're going to talk about our kids, about our education. We're going to talk about our dreams. We're going to talk about these fundamental feelings and standards that we have. Once we've exchanged that in the context of, of business, we have a foundation for peace that is unshakable. Because when I know someone in China and have that kind of respect and equity for them, and then somebody comes along 
from the news media or from a Twitter feed or something as sense, uh, says something that is angry and reactive and hostile to China, I will not only be able to say, stop, think. I'll be able to say, stop, think. I know Mr. Chen from Shanghai. I know his family. I know their story. This is not who they are. They're not attacking us. They are expressing their identity. And they want to do so in a dignified way. And Mr. Chen, when he gets the same kind of propaganda on his side of the ocean, which happens, by the way. I'm sure. You know, <laughs> there are people in China who are equally as ill-informed as some of our people here. Mr. Chen will say, wait a minute, I know Kaui Lucas. I've met her. I know who she is. This is not the fundamental of America, and here's why. That will create a break on reactions for peace. And a number of times when I've spoken to gatherings in China, especially young people and university groups in China, I've had the feeling that somewhere in that audience, there's a pair of ears, maybe just one heart, who will one day grow up to be a leader in the Chinese government. And one day, maybe 20 or 30 years from now, the talk that I gave, the sentiment that I expressed, that we exchanged, just the look in the eyes, will come to their mind when they're at a point of making a judgment for peace. And that's how the fundamentals are, are built. Michael, we have a um, we have a few um, pictures to go along with yeah. this, um, including the um, the posters about the um, the event. So people do, can go online to the yeah joeandlaipeaceinstitute.org. Uh, okay. And from there, you can get tickets for both of these events. And they're they're free. Yes, they're free. Uh, they're free. And um, that our background. Tell us tell us about the background. <laughs> that was a few months ago in Suzhou which is a city not far from Shanghai, a little town of about 8 million people. And most Americans have never heard of it, but it's, uh, it's an ancient imperial capital. It's one of the centers of the silk trade. Marco Polo spent time there. Wow. And this is one of the gardens that Marco Polo was probably at. Wow. And it's been, turn it's been modernized and turned into a gallery. And we went to a full evening celebration that combined some truly strange avant-garde art. You know, abstract and models and lighting and so on that could have come from a runway in New York or Milan with some of this traditional Chinese culture. And they melded together in a continuum that was entirely natural. Let's have some of the other pictures. Okay. So this is where the, the um, Qing Center is at Chaminade. Yes, this is Chaminade. And what else do we have? That's in, uh, there we go. This so is the poster for the exhibition. So you can see it's December 12th uh, from 6 to 8. And our host will be um, Calvin Say, who is the Speaker Emeritus of the, of the House of Representatives, the Assembly in Hawaii. He's the oldest serving, the longest serving uh, speaker of any state legislature in the country. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. And uh, at the bottom, you can see the real the the URL there. The JoeandLaiPeaceInstitute.org. Okay. Yeah. And then and then we had a cute shot of the. There's actually a shortcut that some people might like: ChinaPeaceProject.com, <laughs> and it goes straight here. Okay. All that's right. Easier. And this is the, the this is the Forbidden City in the heart of Beijing. So, in the foreground where we are is Tiananmen Square. Okay. But this is the ancient capital, and in the center is the throne where the emperor was, and no one was allowed to see him. Why I wanted to show this picture is because in 1949, when China became independent, there were millions of people who wanted to storm that place, and. They wanted to loot the place. They wanted to take away all the ancient jade and the carvings. And, the, and Zhou Enlai stood in the door and said, no, we are going to preserve this. This is part of our culture. This is part of our dignity. This is China. We're not going to lose this. And he did that repeatedly throughout that time of conflict when people who wanted to tear down 
everything and start over again. He was the break on that. In many um, artistic and uh, museums and universities and in temples of all the religions all over China, he stood in the door and said no. I think we have uh, uh, pictures of the, the um, there we go. Yeah. You know, this is the National Memorial to Zhou Enlai in Hoi An, and some of the people from here will be coming here on December the 12th. The director of this institution will be here. And Zhou Enlai, when he passed away, he said, I don't want any statues, I don't want any, any memorials, I don't want any sign of me, just burn up my ashes and scatter them all over China, <laughs> which they did out of respect. But 20 years later, a bunch of people in his hometown said, eh, we want to build something here. <laughs> <laughs> so they went ahead and built it. And when they opened it, this facility here, they apologized to, to oh. Joe and I. They said, oh, sorry, we couldn't help ourselves. So who, we had who, to do this. Uh, go back to, let's finish um, talking about the love story a little. So who died first? Do you know? Yes. Who died first? He passed away first in 1976. Okay. And she kept on serving until 1988. So we have about a minute left. Can we see the, the, the one of, this is, there we go, the, yeah. the maple leaf. So tell us about this. This was a time when they were separated. He was in Geneva and she was in uh, Guangzhou and she knew that he was under tremendous stress. And she sent him this maple leaf from their garden and said, I want you to know that I am thinking of you and I send this to you. So he turned around and got a bouquet of flowers from a florist in Geneva and had them sent back to her in Guangzhou. Oh, Michael, thank <laughs> you for this story. So these, this, um, these are other panels that, will be, that are being hung uh, downstairs in the chamber level yes. of our state legislature, and people will be able to just They'll go They'll be open for the whole week, from the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th. They'll be open during the day to the public, no charge for everyone to see. So take a minute if you're downtown and go have a look. It's free, um, and the and think about the the the, the beautiful story of, of of integration, of love, love, love of city, love of country, love of people, mm. and um, how they were translated that passion into a, a, a movement that changed the world. And how those are universal stories. Yes. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Thank you, Kai. Good to see you. See you next week.